Frank Seppi and Robert Wilkins here with Fit to Serve, brought to you by Muscle and Fitness. Robert, who do we have today as our guest? Thanks, Frank, for the introduction. We're honored to have our, our good friend, Dr. Kelly Kennedy, here with us today. Um, Dr. Kennedy has a, a substantial background there in health and fitness and law enforcement community. So, And so that we learn about you, Dr. Kennedy, can you tell us a little bit about your background and yourself and even um, as back as your, when you were a child, did you play sports and were you involved in physical activity growing up? You know what? I was not involved in physical activity growing up. Um, isn't that crazy? But my name is Kelly Kennedy. I'm the, um, I have been working in the law enforcement space since, uh, I guess, really a little bit before 1999. I was hired full time for the largest police department in the Southeast United States. And I've been working there since then. Um, I'm an exercise physiologist and my background is really as a professional, my whole professional career has been centered around working for law enforcement and trying to help them make connections to um, best practices and fitness. And they've been helping me make connections to uh, what they need from a law enforcement perspective. And I kind of try to fill that space with uh, some things that we can do to try to improve performance and reduce injuries in the, in the academy and, um, you know, just occupationally. What's the name of your company? So uh, I incorporated a company called Fit to Enforce in 2003. Mm -hmm. And um, I teach, I teach a course. Uh, it's a college level course for law enforcement officers to have a good option to learn all of the things they would need to learn in order to develop a program for their own department or for an individual or they teach in a group setting so um what are some of the biggest you know, struggles that they have getting into the program like is it mental is it diet is it training what is is it phys physical like what is the what's the biggest struggles that you encounter the biggest struggles I think that, and it's really not, interestingly, it's not really their fault. Mm -hmm. um, the biggest struggles I think law enforcement has faced traditionally is that when they come in to be a police officer, that is that is what they're there for. They want to be, um, they wanna learn as much as they can about their profession. Mm -hmm. um, and what's also put on their shoulders is the responsibility to learn you know, how to train somebody in defensive tactics and how to train somebody as a firearms instructor, uh, how to, how to, a firearms instructor would train someone, you know, to shoot a gun for the first time. So um, they have a lot of responsibilities and they have to wear a lot of hats. They teach mm -hmm. CPR and they teach driving training and they have to become experts at that. Um, and they also have to teach physical fitness. And that's actually the one thing, it's actually the only subject that was completely devoid of any mentorship, mm -hmm. any um, education, any any best practices, because the assumption was that if this person can run and they're fit, then they must know how to teach other people to be fit. And um, when I first got there, I was actually there hired as an aerobics instructor before I started working there full time. And when I started working there full time and observed some of the training that they were doing, I thought it was really interesting, um, some of the ways that they were training. And it wasn't necessarily that it was wrong. It just looked really, um, uh, abstract in some ways, right? Uh, it, it, there, there were a lot of things that I was like, wow, there's some area of opportunity here to, to kind of like freshen what it is that they're doing for the recruits so that they can improve the quality of what they're doing. And so um, that's really how I started kind of figuring out what it is that were the biggest roadblocks. And, and, and it's really, it's an unrealistic expectation to think that you can walk down the hallway and look at someone and say, you're going to, you're going to lead the whole wellness program for our department because, because you like to run. And then now it's their responsibility to, to do all the nutrition instruction that people uh, recruits are asking them you know about supplements what supplements can i take and they're like well you should do keto and they're like well that's not even a supplement but <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> it's just 
<laughs> just like the thing is, is it's not even their fault because they don't necessarily have the support that they need either. And that's changed a lot in the last, I would say, 15 years. That's really kind of like we're we are we're kind of like at the bottom of the mountain when it comes to w what the potential is for mentoring law enforcement and physical fitness, specifically with um, how many universities are starting to offer this as a as a field of study. Mm -hmm. And um, the National Strength and Conditioning Association started the Tactical Strength and Conditioning Conference. Um, and they started that in like 2005 and that has grown by leaps and bounds. So there's just so much more opportunity for people on the outside to learn what law enforcement does and for mm -hmm. law enforcement to attend training. So, so, so Kelly, it, is it basically where, oh, excuse me, Frank, sure. um, where like in the military, if you were fit or you looked fit and you lift weights, you got the job because just by default. And now what you're saying yeah. basically, is that how it was with the law enforcement, but now thanks to um, being a bit smart about what they're doing and all the new information that's available, a trained professional is the way that many law enforcement um, organizations are moving towards. Yeah, they're trying to move toward that. I think that there, there's probably, I don't know the number, uh, but it's probably less than 10% of departments around the country have somebody, I would, I would say that's a really generous number. Mm -hmm. Um, when I first started working in this space, well, I'm going to really depress myself when I tell you guys this, it's a secret. So don't say anything. Um, <laughs> there, was no, there was no internet when I got there. We did not have the internet. So we were looking things up with books and paper. Mm -hmm. And so I was calling the largest police departments in around the country to ask them, where did you get your training for physical fitness? Because I, myself, as an exercise physiologist, needed training in order to understand all of the, uh, all of the nuances of law enforcement different than what I'd learned as a strength and conditioning coach. And, you know, in a, in a, in a setting like a hospital setting or cardiac rehab setting, I wanted to improve what it is I had to offer. And there was really nothing other than Cooper's Institute, which was the gold standard. So when I called Cooper's Institute, they were like, well, you already have a master's degree in this. You shouldn't, this is not a course for you. Mm -hmm. This course is for somebody who doesn't have a background in this. So I was like, well, then, well, then who do I talk to? <laughs> what mm -hmm. do I do? I have to figure this out myself. So, and that was in 99. And so, um, you know, it, it's a completely different situation now. There's a lot more opportunity. So I was kind of a unicorn on an island and no one knew what I did. They didn't know what I could do mm. um, and they didn't know what to do with me. <laughs> so uh, you kind of have to figure that out yourself, you know? It's, I think it's, you know, like with teenagers, I see, I do a lot of seminars and I'm like, so what program are you following? Well, we're following that guy in the gym who's the biggest guy and we're doing this. I'm like, well, what are your specific goals? Well, I don't want to be as big. Well, how do you know he knows what he's doing? Like, you know, I, there's such a need for specific training for what you're going to do. And people don't realize that. They're like, well, if he's going to get strong, I'm going to get strong. Well, there's a lot of different right. things you need to do as, a, as law enforcement. It's the same with the military. And it's a lot is endurance and running and, and such. You know, I think that's a big thing. Like kids and, and people, adults now want to get in shape fast. They're going on TikTok. And they're looking yeah. at people who, you know, have zero credentials, but mm -hmm. they look good and they look good filtered and they look good with music and everything else. And they appeal to these people, but it's not necessary in their best interest. So what are some of the specific things that you you'll have law enforcement do in your program as far as the training? Well, so I would say that we you're like, you're totally spot on, like, like any gym, right? You would go to the gym and you want to pick the biggest, most yeah. posing person. You're like, okay, well, I want to follow what they say. Yeah. Um, and that makes perfect sense. Cause that's really marketing 101, right? Yeah. You have to be yeah. your best example. Uh, and so it's true people, if, if, if you were sitting next to me in, in my gym and people would tell you, well, if some random person would come up and say, well, go get a program from the fitness director, they're going to walk up to you because yeah. you look, you look more intimidating and muscular than I do. they are like, what does she do? Does she teach yoga? <laughs> and so, um, and it's understandable. I get it. So 
but but specifically with with uh, with what it is that, that we're doing with fit to enforce it's it's not only straight line fitness so the way that i explain it is that what what i'm teaching is basically the toolbox and of fitness and then you can put whatever tool inside of it that you want with all sorts of different other certifications that may be leaning one way or another be it um from a crossfit perspective or from a tactical strength and conditioning perspective but but this is going to give you context to understand how to organize all those tools so mm -hmm. that you know the difference between olympic lifting power lifting bodybuilding sure. um and a lot of those things people don't understand Not all and, the same. Um, <laughs> but yeah aren't they all the They're same, all the same. <laughs> right so um and and a lot of the other things that that we deal with from a law enforcement perspective are like you know sometimes it's our responsibility to to, to program someone individually but it's mm -hmm. also our responsibility to go out and teach 40 people with no equipment doing calisthenics outside and so how do you program someone not only the individual and address all of their specific needs but then how are you going to go teach outside if you've never done it before it's different when someone's leading you and you're just you're just counting numbers um, until you have to be in front of them and then you're realizing well I have to tell them what position they need to get in mm -hmm. uh, the preparatory command when it the command of execution how how do I want them to count what is the cadence and mm -hmm. then make it look organized so um, it's a lot and and so this class allows them the practice to do that. It kind of gets the cobwebs out so that people can really practice in real time what they would do with a class. So, um, and that's, I think what what is missing in a lot of training is that everybody kind of wants to go toward, um, you know, an online, online assessment or, uh, you know, there's not a lot of in, in time real practical application for the way, for, for some of the challenges that we have in law enforcement specifically. So, um, so that's why hmm. that's the difference. And do you find that, so you've had uh, 20 plus years of experience in this field. And so do you find that the folks nowadays, like say the, your last class of recruits, are they in just as good as condition as their recruits were 20 years ago or in worse conditioning? Because what we're finding in the military, uh, youth, do not participate in physical activity at the same levels they did years ago. So our numbers are, it's harder to recruit someone for the military. And the biggest reason mm -hmm. for them not able to join the military is because of lack of physical activity and obesity. Mm -hmm. sure. So here in Virginia, Northern Virginia, there was a town, uh, Alexandria, they were offering bonuses for folks that who can come in um, who are underweight because they were finding that so many of the cadets were mm -hmm. overweight and obese. So, are yeah. you finding the same type of um, uh, example in your in your current position? Yes and no. Uh, and the reason that I say that is because um, in the beginning, so our recruits were, they were more fit, I think, when I first started mm -hmm. in general, when they were coming in uh, because they were general population, right? Uh, meaning that, they didn't have any, there was no real pretest requirement for them to get into our department. Only recently in the last couple of years have we required a pretest to get in. So they have to meet a minimum standard. So basically that last 10% have been cleaved. So it's very difficult to say, honestly, what that, that has provided an impact in our minimum fitness like levels when mm -hmm. they come into the academy. Um, but in general, we do, we have seen drift uh, from you know, 20 years ago to now, there has been some drift in fitness. And I think that that also, there is some political play to that too, because a lot of people are not applying. We are having, the nation is is experiencing a deficit in applicants, um, mm -hmm. viable applicants for law enforcement, because it's a very difficult profession right now. Um, a lot of people, they don't have a lot of good public relations. <laughs> a lot of people are, um, you know, experiencing a lot of resistance when it comes to, you know, philosophical differences in policing and um, what's happening in, in, in law enforcement in general. So that's caused a drift in how many people are applying for positions like this. So I think that there's a lot of, and we used to see it also in, 
when we were having a lot more people that were deployed overseas, we had a lot less, you know, military guys that were coming into the academies because they were mm -hmm. already deployed. So all those people, when they're not deployed, they come to the police as, as a natural kind of progression toward law enforcement. And so that also had an impact on the fitness levels that we had coming into the academy. Now you were talking about before you know, if people would come in, they saw me, they saw you, you know, they would think that I was doing the program, what have you. How do you deal with, you know, it's a very male dominated industry with a lot of ego when it comes to fitness and it comes to change. And I'm sure the climate has changed from the nineties to now, but how do you deal with that, like with people who have certain egos and they, they look at, oh, and they say, oh, it's it's a woman trying to teach me and I'm this, you know, masculine guy. What is she going to teach me? How do you deal with that? And how do you like diffuse that and get them on board? You know what? You you have to do it. Um, so I kind of over um, I overshoot my credentials a lot. <laughs> so I have this really, really impressive ball in my office what has all of these certificates and um, from classes that I've taught but not only that you know because you can have I could print all of those up on the internet and frame them all and no one would know the difference whether they're yeah. real or not I could be an absolute fool mm -hmm. um, but I think that the only way you can combat the stereotype or impression that people get of how credible you are is to is to make sure that you are on point with what it is that you're bringing to them. Um, what happens is that when, you, when you're when you in like a government entity for a long time, it's very easy to become comfortable mm -hmm. and to just say, well, you know, I was hired with the credentials that I have and wherever they send me, that's the only training I'm gonna get because I go to training through work, but mm -hmm. I, go, I go to training on my own all the time. I'm taking online courses and it's not because I'm trying to compensate for other people. It's because I'm honestly trying to make sure that the information that I have to offer is is the best that I could possibly give, mm -hmm. and um, and you you have to only respond respond to that with knowing what you know and teaching people what they need to know with and you know with respect, right? Yeah. Because I think that it can be um, if you take I I'm not easily offended. Uh, which I was raised by a firefighter, so uh, and a flight attendant. But but uh, my dad made me, you know, like he he raised me with a lot of grit to make sure that um, you know I'm not going to take things personally, and I don't. And I think that that also helps with my longevity working in a male dominated field, both in strength and conditioning and in um, in law enforcement, because there's no doubt that yeah, it's going to be it can be a deficit if if you allow it, um, you just have to be excellent. I'm not saying I'm excellent, but uh, I, I have to try my best to bring them the best information I can. But I think you would be excellent because you wouldn't be able to last in that environment for 20 yeah, plus years. Absolutely, yeah. And, right. Um, right. But I also think because you've been able to last so long, you've built up allies who can vouch yeah. for what you have been able to do and so you may be in some aspects a pioneer that now young folks coming behind you, you know, 10, 15 years later now look to you as a mentor and to provide that inspiration because you've kind of set the path for them, for them to be successful in this career that's very, very difficult. As you said, especially now with the way that um, the nation and law enforcement's their, the relationship is uh, at this time. Yeah, but it is a really good point that you make. Um, in that, and I do tell people that, that the only way that you'll be able to affect a meaningful change is to make sure that the, the people in the, in, in the department that are most influential and they are, they are the alphas in the department, they have to know who, who they can go to that will have the information that they may not have. And it doesn't offend me when someone wants to fact check what it is that I'm talking about, because I know that I'm not going to lie to them. So if if there's something that I don't know, I'll tell them. I simply don't know the answer. I'll find it out. But um, if they want to double check uh, it, which amino acids are essential amino acids and they want to make sure that I know what I'm talking about, mm. fine. That doesn't offend me. Um, if I did get offended, it's because I feel like somehow I've given them information that I wasn't confident in. Mm. So I think that that has to do with just making sure that 
um, the people in the department that are leaders inside the department know that, yeah, you create those allies by, by just bringing them the best information you can, and then they make their decision. But I, you know, I feel like over the years after, after this long, um, there's, there's some proof of concept there. So, so it, it helps for sure. The, the best proof of concept was at a fitness show. We had a contest for uh, who can hold the longest plank, right? And yeah, I think you win oh, like $100. Yeah. So we had all these MMA guys. We had everybody from all works, ripped up guys and everything else. And there was a woman from the military who smoked them all, <laughs> held an eight minute plank. And at the end, they were like, you have to hear them trash talking. And at the end, they were like, going up to us. So what do you do for your core? And what do you do? And what are you dieting? I was laughing. Mm -hmm. Like, here were all these know-it-alls. They're the best in the world. They were falling out at three minutes, four minutes in this, you know, I think she was a Marine, eight minutes plank. And I, she could have did it all day long, which <laughs> but she just smoked them. And it was like, once you show people what you can do, you're still going to have those naysayers. We have them every time we do our live shows on muscle and fitness, we have so-called trainers and everything who always know better than we do. But when right. you, you know, but the results speak for themselves. What is like, what's the most important or practical, I think, or I guess impactful thing that you can teach the law enforcement people? What's um, the important, like, you know, aspect of what you teach, you think? The most important aspect of, of what it is that, well, I, I mean, I think that they need to know where to get in good information on fitness. Good. Yes. Uh, because th there's there's no like really one thing that you could teach someone to say, well, this is always going to apply. What will always apply yeah. is that if they know where to get the right information, then they'll always have the right information because it's constantly evolving and changing. Um, so no and, TikTok. And, <laughs> pardon? So no, no TikTok. TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's it's just a really good example of the fact that we need we need to be on TikTok more often, right? right. Um, we need to make sure that we're we're getting stuff out there on TikTok so people know. Um, it, it's true, and so a lot of a lot of things that um, uh, a lot of times people are responsible for putting putting lectures together and they will go on Pinterest to try to find pictures of like really attractive slides and stuff that they can use for their presentation. Mm -hmm. And I'll go over their, their, their PowerPoints for them, but people that come to my class just so that I can help, you know, um, just give an extra set of eyes for something. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes they're picking attractive pictures, but the pictures are wrong. The information is wrong. And, and they end up being the nucleus for what's going on and how they disseminate information for their department. And so mm -hmm. it's so important for them to know where those resources are coming from and where they can get good information, you know? Um, and so it, it is really important that that's very important. And also um, collaborating with the people that you're working with. So mm -hmm. I may be an authority on fitness, but I'm, I am not an authority on law enforcement. So making sure that they know that they are the experts in their field and I am an expert in mine. And so um, we collaborate together because I'm not going to tell them how they can be better cops, but I can tell them how they can maybe um, run faster or mm -hmm. I can tell them how they can um, run faster with no warm up or how to accelerate and decelerate in a certain way that will allow them a more effective outcome when they're on the road. But uh, it's sometimes when you have trainers that want so badly to work in this space, mm -hmm. they tend to overreach when it comes to uh, their perception of what they understand of, mm -hmm. of law enforcement and them telling law enforcement what will make them a better cop. And there is no trainer that is an expert in fitness that can ever tell a cop how they can be a better cop. So mm -hmm. um I can, you know, so, so I think just knowing when to ask the right questions and when to make sure to give people the credit that they deserve and the fact that that's, that's their profession and, um, and, and making sure that you can ask the right questions so that you can get them the answers that they need is a really important aspect of, um, of that. So really it's, it's a lot of collaboration. 
It's great. And Dr. Kennedy, when you're talking about um, evidence-based research, do you have a few links or resources that you go to that you could share with the audience and maybe with some of the law enforcement folks who are listening into this podcast that here are some, some sites that I've used over the years that um, they provide, you know, great, reliable information? Yeah. So, you know, um, well, there's, there's, so I'll give you a very simple example is that um, just today, somebody came up to me and they said, take my blood pressure. I think my blood pressure is high. So I took his blood pressure and um, his blood pressure was a little bit high, but it wasn't, you know, dangerous. Uh, and he's like, that's, that's great blood pressure. And I said, well, you know, it's good, but it could be better. We'd like to see it under 120, you know, over 80. And, and he's like, no, that's wrong. They changed the numbers. And I said, well, let me show you a website that you need to go to, to make sure that you're looking at the right place because he goes, no, but I heard that they changed the numbers. So you need to make sure that you know your numbers. And I'm like, okay, well, let's go look. So <laughs> we went to the American Heart Association oh. and um, <laughs> they have a really good like chart that will let you know what blood pressure you should have. Something so simple, you know, um, uh, myplate.gov. <laughs> <laughs> uh, going to government websites to look at like, uh, and also, you know, the tactical strength and conditioning um, website for the National Strength and Conditioning Association. They're doing a lot of great research on uh, law enforcement and physical fitness. So um, the International Society of Sports Nutrition, they have a lot of open access position stands on um, supplements, but, but very basic, uh, you know, like protein creatine, mm -hmm. caffeine, carbohydrate, like they have a lot of open access, right? <laughs> they have a lot of open access information that you can get so that you can get the information that you need and know that it will constantly need to be refreshed and updated. So it's not just one and done. You need to make sure to constantly keep going to those websites to make sure that you, um, you know, can get the most up-to-date information you can. Going back to what you said, um, we have a celebrity trainer on uh, Mark Jenkins. He trained Mary J. Blige, P. Diddy. And he said something very similar in that he's like, I'm not an authority on everything. He's like, if someone wants to do boxing training, I'll bring in somebody who's a boxing coach. You know, if someone wants to do a marathon, I'll bring someone who's a marathon coach. I will teach, teach them the basics of fitness and how to get cheap, but of experts. And I think that makes you credible because some people have so, so their egos are so big and they're so, they, they, they know it all. Like this is better than this. And this is that. I, I like what you were saying and that, you know, you can teach somebody how to get fit, but you can't teach somebody how to be a police officer. And I think that's the problem with a lot of people that you hire or a lot of people that, um, are, that people are following is that, you know, they're following the wrong types of people and getting the wrong information. So as motivated as they are changing, they're not getting the full benefit of that system because the person who's teaching it doesn't know. They're winging it just on ego. So, right. yeah, you know. It's, it's interesting. You're, you're, it's, it's great that you're saying that. And I know that, you know, that's the truth I just had. I just had a conversation with another instructor where I work. Mm -hmm. And um, it, marketing is everything, right? So if, if I go to up to two instructors, and I say, which instructor should I use? This instructor says they know nothing. And this instructor says they know everything. Which one do I choose? Uh, I think it's difficult because if you're if you're somebody who's truly into education, mm -hmm. uh, you probably say that you know nothing. And, and the reason that you say that you know nothing is because you know that, that there is so much information out there that you truly need to learn. That for somebody who says that they know everything, they're, they're, they need a lot more work, you know, because, um, <laughs> yeah. and, and so I, I think that it's really hard because with, with marketing, everything is a 15 second elevator pitch and you have a couple seconds in order to get someone's attention. So mm -hmm. the moment that you get someone's attention, that's your opportunity to like grab them and convert them into a, into a member, into a client, mm -hmm. into a um, paying, you know, a person subscriber. And so um, I think that that can diminish the true value of what, you know, what a tempered, 
type of um, instructor can really bring. And you're, you know, that's a great example that you used when yeah. we're kind of like contractors, right? A contractor is not going to build your bathroom. They're going to get somebody to do the bathroom and they'll oversee the work to make sure that it's right because their responsibility is to oversee the whole house. And, yeah. um, you know, and as a trainer, you want to use people that are really, really granular with certain things in order to get the best to them. So, um, you know, Makes sense. So that's, I, yeah. I remember taking yoga for the first time and a woman came up to me and uh, she was like, this is a lot harder than lifting weights, isn't it? And I was like, well, I bring, you know, the barbell in this 106 degree heat. I think, you know, I, I beg to differ, but it's just amazing to me how many people think one, you know, one form of fitness is better than the other or, uh, you know, it just, I don't just just my own pet peeve. I'm just like, I don't know. Like, you know, I think every, to be a balanced, I'm sure to be a balanced uh, person or a balanced law enforcement person, you have to know a little bit about everything or utilize yeah. that in the program. Right. They don't work together. I mean, you could be strong, but are you flexible? You know, like, right. I mean, you know, so especially dealing with military and, and law enforcement, you have to be a little bit of everything. You know, you have to have endurance, right? You have to have strength flexibility uh good eyesight <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. And kelly and with uh frank is saying to to um elaborate on that a little bit more is it that training principles have changed much so i would assume based on my own personal experience in the military that when i joined in the mid 80s there wasn't much discussion about yoga mental health and stretching mm -hmm. now for for some of those who are more elite they probably were doing those things but now, have you found that more law enforcement um, officers are more inclined or more willing to try yoga classes and talk about mental health and to do more stretching and, and even maybe learn more about nutrition because they understand that the more fit they are, the more effective they will be at work? Mm -hmm. Right. <clears throat> yeah, I 100% agree with you. In the, you know, in the 80s and 90s, it was very common to do a lot of like a lot of running, push-ups, sit-ups, pull-ups. And those were the exercises that were done and, you know, outside with recruits. And this was the the only way that they knew to, um, and that's that was the fitness industry by and large, you know, when you're outside doing calisthenics, you're doing, you know, the regular calisthenics that everybody thinks about when they were in elementary school. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, there wasn't a lot of creativity, but with a, especially from the law enforcement side, um, uh, there has been a very, very strong push in officer, what's called officer wellness. Officer wellness, really, in my opinion, uh, the reason they call it officer wellness is in order to, uh, to kind of break down a lot of the perceptions of looking or seeking psychological uh, services for, um, to debrief after a horrible scene that you've seen or um after engaging in something that you know probably could lend itself to um uh that that could cause really big problems down the road psychologically for people mm -hmm. um it, it was a bit more of a of of um of an issue for cops to be okay with going to psychological services to talk to a therapist about what what they'd seen and a lot of times that was seen as, you know, weakness, but the reason it was seen as weakness is because the only time they would use a psychologist is to make sure someone was fit for duty after they had been displaying some, some, um, you know, evidence of having struggled mentally with some of the things that they've seen, you know, and so that now they're going to a psychiatrist or a psychologist to make sure that they're still okay for the job. So you're either thumbs up or thumbs down, and then you may be off the force. So there is a lot of apprehension when it came to talking to someone to say, well, I don't want them to think I'm crazy, but I did just see something horrific and I'm a human. So, but over time, you just keep collecting these these injuries, you know? And so officer wellness, uh, in my opinion, was a, a way to kind of like soften the um, the entry for officers to, to use psychological services. Hmm. Uh, but it really incorporates a lot more than just psychological health, right? It incorporates, 
exactly what you had mentioned. It incorporates uh, not only nutrition, but physical health, um, occupational health, uh, all of the aspects of wellness that we that we know um, are important for a well-rounded person. And so, um, so officer wellness is a much bigger initiative now. Uh, there was a um, in 2015, uh, the 21st century policing um, came out from. Uh, I want to say um, it was in 2015, and um, that mentioned a lot of those initiatives for officer wellness. So that's created a large trend in um, in making changes for law enforcement with the services that they provide. So a lot of other departments are starting now to seek out exercise physiologists, psychiatrists, um, psychologists to mm. uh, to work full time on their departments. And, um, and it's creating a huge change in the way that law enforcement views, um, you know, being healthy and being well-rounded, you know. Um, th there's a lot of, you know, when, when people come into the academy, they're quite young and they have now a retirement and they have all these decisions to make on their own investments and they don't have any background in that. They don't know what they should be doing. So, um, and then they get to retirement and they're like, okay, well, I have a retirement, but their financial health also needs to be addressed. And so a lot of times that can cause strife in their relationships at home because of financial wellness hasn't been maybe looked at. So there's so many different aspects of, um, you know, where things can go wrong. And so I think that only recently has, has the industry started to look a little bit closer in all of those aspects of service to their own employees to make sure that they've addressed those concerns. They're doing that with the um, NFL, most major league sports now. And when someone enters their NFL or NBA, they have them sit down with a, a retirement, a financial advisor, a you know all different aspects of mental health, everything else. But I think the '90s pretty much destroyed the way we look at police officers like lethal weapon with donuts and mental health and everything else. If you watch every movie, there's always a dirty cop or someone eating donuts or out of shape. We need a we need a reboot of like, you know, some positivity with the, with today's law enforcement. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, and Kelly, how about um sleep? How important is the role or the impact of sleep on mm -hmm. an officer's wellness? Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And that's the, another great point that you're making is that um, sleep is um, one of those so underrepresented aspects of recovery. So your, your training can be on point, your nutrition can be on point. And if you're not sleeping, if you're working, if you're working really long shifts and you have restless sleep, um, then you can't properly recover. There's just no way that you can do it. Uh, it, it causes um, a lot, a lot more. Um, it it requires your body a lot more time to recover from how you beat it up throughout the day, and um, and sleep is something that we're really sleep hygiene, right? Is a is a, a catchphrase. Yes. So we're looking a lot about mm. um, how we can help propagate better sleep. I just interviewed a police officer here in New York who's a uh, competitor, and he was talking about sleep and how, you know, back, he was on the force for probably 20 years, how they changed. Like, they would actually, he would go two, three days sometimes with overtime, with an arrest, without getting sleep and everything else, and he's just not doing it now. Now he's bringing right. his food and Tupperware because he's like, he has extra food in his car because he's like, if I make an arrest, I want to make sure that I have the proper nutrition. And and right. he's like, because there's no way you can have good decision making if you if you don't get enough sleep. And obviously your body's not going to be working at its optimal, uh, you know, place. So it's, so obviously people downplay the need for sleep, but, you know, ask anybody right. if they don't sleep for, you know, a day, all bets are off <laughs> on how you yeah. perform and everything else. So... Yeah. And, and I think that there's a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot of pressure to make sure that, that you're not, um, you know, sleep is for the week. So you need yeah. to sleep. We've got a job to do. And yeah. so, um, 
you know, like they look, they're looking at Navy SEALs who are going through buds training and they're like, well, they haven't slept, so I'm not going to sleep. Yeah. But essentially no one can focus really well when they've not been sleeping or recovering or eating. And what you know, you bring up a great point. We've had other, uh, there was a time where we had some, some cops that were competitors and uh, we brought them in to talk to the recruits to say, how do you deal with shift work? How do you deal with making sure that you're getting your meals in because you have the same job that everybody else does. So the mm -hmm. difference between you and everyone else is that you're making feeding yourself a priority. You're making training yourself a priority. And so while not everybody may be interested in that level of competition, um, there are certainly a lot of great habits that they can instill oh. in young officers who are dealing with a lot of, you know, shift work that they can improve how they're eating. Regardless of, of who you are or if you compete or you don't, you need to have a plan and you need right. to you know plan out your day. I thought police officer was funny because I was like, what happens when you make it? And my question was, what happens when you make an arrest and you have, you know, another 12 hours? He's like, well, depends on what they did. <laughs> He's like, no, 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 I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Belly, do, do you um, know that with all the changes in training and nutrition and exercise and principles mm -hmm. and all, have do law enforcement agencies keep data to see that if the health span and the lifespan of, mil of uh, police officers has improved? So, for example, are they going to the doctors more often than they used to? Uh, are they sicker? Are they have more sick days out of, you know, off their beats because they've been injured? Do you know, like with all this training that, you know, people are, are trying to provide to the officers to make them better officers, is it impacting their job performance where they're able to work longer uh, with less injuries and maybe less mental stress as well? What a great question. I wish I had known that question before I got here. <laughs> <laughs> I do not know. I don't know if, if, that is a great, I don't know if that's been looked at um, with all of the aspects that you just mentioned, right? But certainly when it comes to like sick days uh, um, or like maybe longevity after retirement, a lot of those things are looked at. Um, and uh, I would have to take a look to see what, what the results of that is, I mean, I know that, um, you know, I, I looked for my own purposes where I work just to see, you know, about like um, trends in, in injuries and in certain time frames or whatever. Um, but there's a lot of limitations to how that information and oftentimes departments don't share that information. So it's very difficult for them to share information from department to department unless there's, there may be maybe the department of justice has information like that, that I'm, that I, that I am not aware of, but I'll look into that because that's a great, it's a great question that you ask. Um, you know, and I think when looking at trends and knowing what's effective and what's not effective, that th those would be great, great lenses with which to look at it. And the reason I, I thought about it is because I, we are working with some various organizations and the American Red Cross was sharing some information that when they're working with the military men and women who are about to transition, especially the retirees who have spent 20 years plus in this disciplined lifestyle, the first year they're out of the military, the average weight gain is 30 pounds. So mm -hmm. they don't go from at weight to um, overweight. They go from whatever their weight was to obesity, bringing right. all these other medical conditions along with them. And many of them say that they, they had, they wanted a break from exercising, but right. more importantly, and more, more often is that they miss the team that they were with, mm -hmm. that they exercised together. That when they went to the gym, there were four or five people there who kept them on target wearing those uniforms. Uh, you know, they didn't want to look bad in uniform. So that helped, you know, control their weight. But uh, the military is trying this new process where, you know, we hire you when you're young, when you're in the best shape, and often you leave the military in your worst shape. How do we right. correct that so mm -hmm. that we give you a better span of health? not yeah. just a lifespan of 77 and being yeah. sick from 50 on, how about, you know, you live a quality life all the way to your last days, meaning that you do principles of 
uh, weight management and sleep and nutrition and stress relief and taking care of your finances, all those things bring you to a better state of health. So right. I would think if it, it's going to work for the military, it would do the same in the law enforcement, special forces communities, firefighters, all these communities are, are, are similar in some ways. And uh, we want to look at how do we take care of the folks after their service to, to their cities, to their states, to their country. Right. You're, I mean, it's a great, that, that has been a huge issue for a lot of people that retire is that the moment that they retire, what they say that they miss the most is they miss, you know, the sense of community. Right. Mm -hmm. And so they miss the people. And um, when they, when they make that switch from being sworn to now being uh, retired, uh, they, they, they're trying to call the people that they used to work with. Hey, do you want to go have coffee? Well, I'm working. I, I can't just go have coffee right now. Or, um, you know, they're trying to connect with people that they used to work with when in fact they need to probably connect with people that are already retired and, and find other people that are in the same space that they are in at that time. But it takes a while to kind of may, maybe make that mental shift. And a lot of people have difficulty with that. Understandably, I have been there 24 years and I think I would have difficulty leaving, um, you know, leaving that sense of community, that huge mm -hmm. sense of community that you create over that many years. And so uh, I 100% I agree with you. I think that we're, we are looking into creating a better kind of step down program for lack of a better term. Uh, you know, for for uh, people that are retired, because essentially that's a bigger a, a bigger number of people than we actively have on our department right now. Mm. So you know, and and so some military bases have had some great um, programs where retirees, going even back to Vietnam veterans, come and train with the young soldiers, airmen, guardians now. And what they do is they share that wisdom that they've gained, you know, 30, 40, 50 years ago, but the enthusiasm of the young recruits provides that to the older recruit or, or to the veterans. And sure. so now they have this great community and it seems like it could probably work in law enforcement too, where those veterans who have retired come and share their experiences. The younger folks, again, share their workout tips with, with the older folks, but now this is a community of give and take and uh, both, both parties uh, benefit from these relationships. Oh yeah, that's a great, yeah. that's a great point. We just gave you four new businesses to tackle. Yeah, yeah the next thing you know. She's starting a retirement uh, workout. Yeah, workout. Dr. Kelly Kennedy hey, sponsored by Humana. On all the stats, yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot <laughs> going on here. Oh, well. Well, Frank, we, we look like we, we've taken a lot of Dr. Kennedy's time. Do you have some question or a question or two to, to wrap this all up? No, I think we we got it all. I think um, you know we want to give the information on e fit to enforce for everyone who's give the website and everything else. Kelly, Dr. Kelly. Oh yeah, that's me. Sorry. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like, well, sure. yeah. <laughs> so it's a uh, the website is fit to enforce dot com, and um, uh, we're going to be we teach several times a year. Um, the information for what it is that I do is, you know, is there and I'm on LinkedIn as well. Um, Kelly Kennedy um, from Miami. So um, my uh, business is on there too, Fit to Enforce. And uh, we're going to be teaching a class in the beginning of June in Memphis, Tennessee. So hopefully um, that's that's always a we we usually go there once a year or once every other year um and uh we're going to be in St. Louis at the end of the year so um you know if you want to check out a class or reach out and get information I'm happy to um we'd love to see one of these classes uh, do you film it video it at all because we'd love to see one on put it on muscle and fitness to show people you know it's private. It, it, Right. Yeah. It's funny. I, uh, I've the last two classes, they've been, somebody has asked me that very same thing. So I guess I have to learn how to set up a camera. Yes. I film myself. I'll be like, <laughs> yeah, I'm filming myself right now. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to do that. I'll yeah, figure that out. Love to put it on muscle and fitness, uh, to show people, you know, uh, all aspects of 
uh, fitness and uh, just becoming a better person too. I think that's what it's about. Like all these programs, the bottom line is it makes a better you. So right. see it. Yeah, so, I appreciate that. Thanks. I'll do yeah. that. Well, Thank thanks, you. Dr. Kennedy, for your time. So um, we'll have you back sometime. And if you ever have sure. something you need to share with our audience or some big groundbreaking one of the new jobs that you're going to probably have, have after this <laughs> podcast that you start, let us know so we can help publicize that as well. But thank you for what you're doing for the community and for law enforcement officials. You know, with the information and the services you're providing are helping them get back home every day and every night. Mm -hmm. So their families, I'm sure, are also very appreciative of what you do. So thank you. And uh, we'll look forward to having you again on pretty soon. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate